a heads up. Okay. So quick, what we're going to be going over today. A uh, Luke, uh, we're Luke. Gonna, this is really Luke. just an introduction for casual racers, people who are new to racing. Maybe you've got a cruising boat and you've seen the uh, big groups of folks out there going around and, and want to know what that's all about and how you can get involved. Um, sailboat racing, you know, is a pretty old sport. It's very inclusive. We want to make sure as many people get up there as possible. So this is really designed for those people who have, uh, have you know, are super new to the sport. Uh, so we're going to start off by going over some of the race documents, uh, notice race and sailing instructions. We'll talk about some common course layouts, uh, some you know local knowledge here in Chicago, things to expect. We'll talk through one of the things that I know always scares new people, which is the starting sequence. Um, and uh, also go over some of the basic rules. There's, you know, like pages and pages of rules, but really there's only a handful that are particularly important for new racers out there. So by way of introduction, uh, my name is Luke Wolbrink. Uh, I am the Vice Commodore at Jackson Park Yacht Club. I own and race on my CNC 35 Mark III named Zella. Uh, I've also spent some time working as a Casper board member and been racing around on Lake Michigan for the better part of 10 years. Um, George, if you want to meet yourself and introduce yourself. Yes, uh, hello, I'm George Chapala. Um, I've been actually racing offshore since 2001, a little bit on and off, so about over 15 years of offshore racing experience. I've been a member of Jackson Park Yacht Club for the past few years. I do have a, a smaller boat in Harbor, but I also race on some offshore boats, and I have experience with both race, race committee for both buoy and some of the long distance races that we have. Uh, you know, moving on, just a little bit of an advertisement here. So this is being hosted by Jackson Park Yacht Club. Uh, Jackson Park Yacht Club is obviously located in Jackson Outer Harbor, down on the south side of the city. Um, we absolutely invite everybody on this uh, presentation to come on down, check out the harbor, uh, spend an afternoon down there. It's a really uh, family-friendly, quiet harbor. Uh, this is actually a particularly exciting year for us at Jackson Park Yacht Club. This is our quasquicentennial season, and you guys can look that up. That actually is a word. Um, it's 125th season, uh, making us one of the oldest yacht clubs on Lake Michigan. Um, we are really proud that we're a national leading in promoting diversity in sailing, um, especially being on the south side. It's, it's a natural fit for us. Uh, and we're also just a full service yacht club. We have certain different social events all year long. Uh, you know, we have a variety of racing uh, from keelboats to dinghies. We even start doing some remote control sailboat racing. Uh, there's kayaks, you name it. Um, you know, and there's just certainly always people around it and good community around us. Um, we also have a very uh, robust junior sailing program through the Jackson Park Yacht Club Foundation. And, and thank you to anyone on this call that actually did uh, take the call to action and, and donated to them. Uh, the one really great thing about the foundation is that they provide free sailing instruction to at-risk youth. Um, so there's a lot of kids that we know in the city that would have no reason to ever come down to the lake, especially go sailing. Um, and the foundation does a fantastic job in uh, giving them that opportunity. Uh, if you ever have any more questions about the club, uh, you know, feel free to throw something down in the chat or you are of course uh, welcome to email our club coordinator and at the uh, email address here. So without any further ado, let's get going. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna start talking about here is race documents. And this really forms the basis of uh, races. So the first one that you're gonna see is going to be a notice of race, sometimes referred to a notice of series if it's a variety of races. Um, these are typically published well in advance of an event. And really the idea is to provide basic race information to help a skipper uh, decide if they want to do the race. So in it, you're going to see things like who's organizing the event, um, whether it's one club, two clubs, you know, who knows. Um, there's also going to be information on sort of the when, where, kind of information, you know, that'll typically say something along, you know, the lines of it'll be held in the waters of Lake Michigan in, you know, sailing area four on June 4th, you know, it'll be some sort of information on there to help you understand what you're, uh, you're committing to. There's also, it'll have some information on any special rules, scoring prizes. So the rules that typically will reference the racing rules of sailing, which we'll be getting into later here. Um, it'll also talk about scoring and how, you know, different uh, boats and, and they finish will 
be scored. We'll talk about that as well. And then it also, you know, will tell you if, if you're winning, if you're competing for flags or competing for a pickle dish or whatever sort of the rewards are at the end of the race. Um, oftentimes there's also eligibility requirements. For the most part, if you're on this uh, webinar, you probably have a boat that's, red, that's eligible for most races. Um, for Kazra races in particular, it's gonna be, you know, pretty seaworthy keel boat. Um, Kazra doesn't really deal much with in the realm of dinghies, um, but, you know, certainly even for dinghy races, there will be a notice of race out there. Um, so it'll tell you what sort of equipment you might need to have, safety equipment, things like that. Um, it'll also have registration information. So for most races here in Chicago, um, registration, you can go through CASO's website um, or, you know, which will bring you to yacht scoring. Sometimes for like out of town races, the Queens Cup, the Hook Race, uh, the Mac Race, things like that, uh, you have to go to the hosting Yacht Club's website. But usually it's pretty easy to find and, and that information will be in the same spot that you find the uh, notice of breaks. So um, through a couple terms at you in that last discussion. So, um, you know, when we're talking about scoring and handicaps, it becomes a really important thing to understand of, of what you need to do in order to join a race. So when we're scoring a race, they pretty much everything falls into one of two categories. So you have, either have a one design course or you have a handicapped race. Uh, one design races are just that. All the boats are exactly the same. So common ones here in Chicago are the Tartan 10s, J105s, Manito 36 36.7s. Um, you know, there's there's other races that'll just be all star boats or all lasers in the dinghy kind of class. Um, the idea here is all the boats are identical. So uh, the first boat to finish is the winner. Uh, it makes scoring pretty straightforward and pretty easy. Um, for all the rest of us, and I'm guessing the majority of people on this webinar will fall into the second category where you sort of have a, a boat that there's not a ton of the exact same boat trying to race. Um, so we handicap it. So it's not terribly different than those of you who go. And the idea is boats are assigned a rating based on their speed capability. Um, and then using some math, the finished times are taken, elapsed times and things like that are all calculated in order to give you a corrected time. And then that corrected time can be compared to the other boats in your section. Um, there is no perfect uh, system for this. We'll talk in a second about the different systems that might be out there, but um, it does a pretty good job of keeping things fair so that you know, there's plenty of opportunities and I've been on lots of races where uh, I haven't crossed the finish line first, but I end up coming in uh, at the end of the day pretty well. So it's it's keeps things relatively exciting. Um, for the most part in Chicago, uh, the vast majority of races use PERF, PHRF. Um, there's also other rating systems, but that's the most common one. So speaking of PERF, um, it stands for Performance Handicap Racing Fleet. Um, hopefully you'll never have to remember all that, just know it's PERF. Um, and again, it's the handicap system that's probably most common in North America. Uh, there are other ones like ORR and ORC that you may see uh, thrown around out there. Um, just basically different ways of, of accomplishing the same thing, which is to try and compare the speed capabilities of boats. Um, again, here in Chicago, pretty much everybody relies on PERF. Um, the local authority for which is Lake Michigan PERF, LM PERF. Um, so it's something that we, you know, if you're gonna be going out there racing, you're strongly encouraged to have a PERF rating um, and a PERF certificate might be referred to as. Um, I know for the casual race series, it's not a requirement. Again, it's, it's encouraged, but if you're gonna be doing any of the jam section or spinnaker section, it's pretty much required that you have a certificate. Um, and then if you're just doing beer cans at your local club, um, I would check in with the race committee to see what they require. Um, so, just some quick information on how to get a certificate. Um, it has a nominal fee. I wanna say it's like 60 bucks, 75 bucks, something like that, it's not too much. Um, and basically you go in, request an account and um, you, they will set you up with what you need to do. Um, you know, as a note for the JPYCers on here, we do not require it, but again, it's highly recommended to get a purse certificate. It just makes your life easier to do. Um, so after you've logged into Limperf and you're looking at getting you know, what do you need to provide them? And it's really just uh, your basic information for who you are, what your boat's name is, number, things like that. Um, and then it's gonna be key dimensions. And that's what this little diagram over on the right side is. So um, this is actually pulled from Lim Perf's website. So you can find most of these dimensions on the manufacturer's website. If you have that, maybe a user manual or at the worst case scenario, go to sailboat data. 
Um, and if you're really getting aggressive, you can you know, go out and measure your boat up. And um, they have actual measurement procedures and all that. So at the end of this webinar, we'll be sending out um, a PDF of this deck. So you guys will have access to these links, but they're all right there online. It's super straightforward. Um, one thing to keep in mind is like everything in sailboat racing, uh, all these measurements are self-reported. Uh, it's the honor system. So, you know, do your best and, you know, be transparent about it. Everybody's assumed that you're not lying and cheating. As if you are, it'd be pretty embarrassing. Um, you know, there's there's ways to go out and have people officially measure your boat, but really for the sake of inclusion, um, you know, it's set up so that it's all self-reported. Okay. So now we've understood, you know, what we need to do to get our boat registered. We've got a per certificate. We know when the race is, uh, roughly where it's going to be. We know it's on Lake Michigan around Chicago. Um, so now what? Uh, at some point, usually following the issuance of the notice of race, you'll get an issuance of sailing instructions uh, referred to as the SIs. I know CASR typically tries to produce these all at once. Sometimes they're not. Um, and really the sailing instructions is the how-to for race day. Um, to the point of even some races, you don't get the sailing instructions until maybe the day before the race. Um, and this is really the, the nuts and bolts that you need uh, after you've already registered. So this is where it'll give you a description of what the course is gonna look like, where things are gonna go. Um, it'll tell you how different divisions and sections are broken down so people can be scored fairly. Uh, it'll tell you start times um, so you know exactly when to show up, not just, you know, Sunday afternoon. Um, if there's going to be post-race activities, so probably not going to be a ton of them, unfortunately, in 2021. There definitely weren't any in 2020, but in more normal times, there's frequently some sort of party wrapped up thing at the host yacht club. Um, so you'll get details on that. You'll get details on uh, any, you know, mooring instructions if there's, you know, free dockage available after the race, things like that. Um, and you'll be able to find these sailing instructions on the regatta website. Uh, yacht scoring definitely will email them out once you're once you're registered to make sure that everyone has them. Um, so those are you know good places to make sure. But this is something to make sure you have before you head out on the day of the race because uh, without it you're going to be pretty lost. Um, one thing you'll also see frequently is amendments. So you know all of these documents and everything race committee it's done by people uh, and people make mistakes. So, uh, or just don't have complete information because they're trying to get information out quickly. So you may see um, up to typically like 12 hours before the race, uh, an amendment come out. It'll be typically email, it'll be posted on the Regatta website, a whole lot of ways it's pretty, they make themselves pretty obvious. Um, and, you know, they'll have any sort of clarifying information. If there's a correction, there may be an update to the courses available. Uh, oftentimes, if the sailing instructions are published early, they won't have an exact breakdown of start times by which section it is because they don't have a complete list of registrations. So they may wait to like the day before to issue that. So this will be coming out in your uh, amendment, you know, the, the evening before the race kind of thing. And again, it, it's, once you're registered, uh, we live in the beautiful virtual age here and, and everything will be emailed to you. So you'll have access to that, but make sure you keep an eye out for them because it's, if it's coming out in amendment, it's probably important. Okay. So not sure. I haven't seen too many questions down in the chat. Um, and again, if you guys have questions, uh, we'll take brief, you know, stop points between sections to talk about questions, but without seeing any down there, um, I think we'll just keep on rolling into one of the things that uh, I know when I started racing was one of the more intimidating parts of sailing. And it's really not that terribly complicated. Um, and that is the whole start sequence. So, um, you know, the funny thing about it here is it goes five, four, one, go. Um, there is no three, there is no two. Um, those need to be in your head. So a couple quick definitions. Um, and this is something that has changed in 2021 with the racing rules. Um, a boat is considered to have started when her hull in, uh, is on the pre-start side of the line. And you've started when you've crossed the start line after the, the start signal. Um, it seems pretty obvious. The main change here from previous uh, wording, it was... Uh, you know, the previous wording, any part of the boat crossing the line started constituted a start. Now it's just the hull. So it's just the fiberglass, if you will. 
Um, this was really put in place because you were getting boats out there with, you know, eight, 10 foot long prods on the front end and trying to count that, um, which people felt was kind of cheaty. So now it's defined as any part of your hull. Um, and then similarly, the finish is considered when the, any part of your hull. So more, more frequently than not, it's going to be, you know, the first piece of fiberglass in the front of your boat crosses the finish line. Um, and, but on the finish, it's important to understand that your entire boat does not need to cross the finish line. If you're running parallel to the finish line for some reason, and you quick duck down and, you know, put the bow across and then come back up, that technically counts as a finish. Um, you'll probably want to pay attention if you're pulling something like that to make sure that race committee saw that you crossed, but um, that's really the spirit of things here. So, okay, you've, you've got your SIs, you've got your crew on your boat, you're ready to go. Um, now, what do you do? So the first part happens well before that start sequence, and it's really just arriving to the start area, um, especially for some of the bigger regattas. This can be a bit intimidating because there might be 50, 60, 100 boats sort of floating around, um, and it seems a bit chaotic. So one thing I just recommend is always arrive early, understand what your start time is, and plan on arriving You know, maybe a half hour before that. Um, you know, My guess is if you're on this seminar, you probably aren't sailing on a TP-52, so you're gonna be one of the first starts anyways. So there's really no disadvantage to making sure you get there early. It helps you get a lay of the land, um, make sure you can get checked in and things like that. So what you'll do is you'll show up to the area. Um, if for some reason you are running a bit late and you can see the boats are in sequence, um, where you just look at your watch and you know that it's happening, um, make sure you stay out of sort of the trapezoid behind the start line so that you know, you're not in the way of anybody who's trying to get started. Um, you just need to be sort of careful to stay out of everyone's way at that point. Um, again, this is why you show up early. Um, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna find there'll be the committee boat or there might be a check-in boat that'll explain which one you're looking for in your sailing instructions. Uh, but most commonly it's gonna be the committee boat. Um, you, they're pretty obvious. It's typically some sort of power boat. Sometimes it's a sailboat with a whole bunch of flags up and people standing in the back of it looking like they're being busy with something. Um, so you're gonna go, you know, sail on by them, motor on by them, whatever makes sense to you. Um, and, you know, go shout over to them, say good morning. You know, this is Zella, it's sail number 84044, checking in. Um, that's all they need to know is your boat name and your sail and that you're checking in. They'll wave to you or say thank you. And you know that you've checked in for the race. And at that point, get the heck out of the way um, and, you know, start thinking about what you need to do to start your race. Um, it's a good idea to start again, looking at sort of the layout of the start area, um, you know, what flags might be up. We're going to talk about the flag sequence in a moment. Um, and then the other important thing here is to, this is a sailboat race. It's not a motorboat race. So make sure you turn off that engine. Um, if you have your engine running after uh, a certain point in the prep signal, you can be penalized. So at this point, you know, if, as long as you can sail uh, safely, I would recommend turning off the engine you've got time to get to where you need to be at that point. Okay, um, so you've arrived, you've got checked in, and now you gotta figure out when are you supposed to do this, this starting thing, right? The, uh, everything on the race course is handled with a variety of horn blasts and flags. Uh, race committee may or may not come on the, uh, the radio and tell you what's going on, but everything really is handled via horns and flags. Um, so in your sailing instructions, when you, and probably an amendment, uh, when you're looking, it'll tell you what section you're in and will tell you what flag is associated with that flag. So, um, you know, the, the diagram over here on the right is, you know, they're international code flags. Um, you'll be hanging one of these off of your backstay for the SIs that designates that you're part of that particular section um, so that everybody out on the race course knows sort of who you're racing against. Um, these flags will be mimicked on the committee boat. So you can get an idea of who's going to be starting based on what flag they have up. Um, and you can also get an idea of where they're at. So if you know that you're the third section to start, it's a good idea to understand what the section flag is right before you. So when you see all those boats congregating around the start line and you see the race committee playing with that flag, you know, hey, I need to pay attention, I'm next. Um, so we're gonna go into this in detail, but this is really the nuts and bolts of the start here. Um, 
So you know, feel free if it, if it makes sense to you, print out this slide and keep it with you because this sort of tells you uh, what you're looking for. Um, you know, these are sailboats; they're not motorboats, obviously. So they're in constant motion. So there's no ability. It's not like a, a you know a race car start where everybody can be at you know a fixed position and then go. Um, you are in constant motion. So there's a whole lot of rules about uh, right of way that George is going to be talking about in order to help avoid collisions. Um, and keep things orderly. You know, as a new racer, um, they would, uh, as a new racer, I generally have the idea that just keep clear of everybody if uh, possible. Oh, someone's saying they don't see my screen. I'm sorry, folks. I don't know why it didn't share. Is that better? No, we see your screen. I see your screen. Not that should be sharing now. Uh, Luke, we do have a question though about how racers do get the flags for their boat, um, and 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 I will I can I can answer very quickly. Usually in the sailing instructions, they'll tell you what flag indicates your section. If it's one of the international okay, code I think flags, you guys should be able to see the screen now. Sorry about say, that. If it's, this would have made a lot more sense if you weren't just looking at my face. No, the screen was fine. The screen was fine. Um. So okay. the uh, Luke, can okay, you hear so, me? Yeah. Stay out of generally speaking, try and avoid collisions uh, unless you are extremely confident in in what you're doing and the rules. Uh, I would make sure to stay just out of people's way. Um, the race committee is going to go through a series of movements. Again, we're going to get into the details of these. Um, and one thing that's important to remember is there's there's gonna be potentially radio announcements, there's horns going off and there's flags going around. Um, when the rubber meets the road, we can't, um, we can't uh, rely on the sounds. We have to only rely on the flags. So precedence is for the flags only. Um, it looks like we do have a couple of questions in the chat. So let me quick jump into and take a look at those. Um, Chieka wanted to know, um, you know, how do you, Oops. yeah, yeah Luke, so, um, the, the, oh, I'll the mention it. So, on the back the, of your boat, yeah, the, you you're doing the casual races, oftentimes Casra will provide them. Um, okay. if you're doing a jam section or one of the racing fleets, uh, it's your responsibility to provide your own flags. You can go to West Marine and buy them. Um, it doesn't need to be anything formal. All these shapes are pretty straightforward. I've even seen people just make their own, especially sort of this, uh, the, the flag that, that we have up here, um, the, the five flag is pretty straightforward. It's a red X um, is how you handle those, Chieko. Okay, and do you have to get the, like the whole set or is there also, certain? Um, and you know, again, they're usually typically attached to, they're typically attached to your back stay. Okay. So at five minutes, the um, this is really when your your world is going to be starting in the start sequence. So uh, the thing to keep in mind here is if you're not the first start of the day, your five minute warning may actually be uh, the zero um, or the the start signal for the previous section. Um, so it's again that idea of paying attention to the the section before you is important to know who's going before you because you might be starting right on the heels. There may not be a gap. It could be their zero is your five. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind and always be paying attention for for who's ahead of you. Um, so at uh, at five minutes, the current section, their section flag will be raised. Um, and that's all that's going to be up there. It's going to be their, their section flag is going to be up. There's going to be a short blast of a horn from race committee. Um, and at that point, you know that you are in sequence and you have five minutes to start. Um, if you have a timer on your boat, this is when you want to make sure that you're paying attention and ready so that you can set your timer for those five minutes and get your countdown going. Um, the other things, you know, what you're doing at this point when you're out there and you know you're in sequence, is really just getting a feel for where your competition is, uh, where you are in relationship to that start line. 
as well as uh, you know starting to formulate a plan. Um, this the start sequence is all about just having a plan on how to reach that start line uh, exactly where where and when you want to. Okay, um, so then you know you're sailing around, and a minute later, uh, you are going to hear a, another short blast from race committee. And at this point, the P flag, which is this blue flag with the uh, white square in the center of it, is going to go up. So this is the preparatory signal um, that's raised at four minutes. So again, at this point, you're going to see your section flag and the prep flag, just as as is in this image. Um, and that's when people are you know know the race is starting to get serious. So at this point. The rules, the right of way rules are all going to start taking effect. Um, things like your engine can now get you penalized. So make sure that that's off. You're not spitting that water out the back of your engine. Um, and just like as before, you're going to be continuing to maneuver. Uh, you're going to be executing your plan to reach that start line right at zero is the goal. The goal in, in a racing start is to, um, you know, you've perfected it. If you can get to the start line on the preferred tack right at zero at full speed, that's always the goal. Um, as a new racer, I would probably be more conservative because it's more difficult to deal with things if you start early than to if you start 30 seconds late, it's probably fine. Um, you know, as you get better and better and have a better understanding of the rules, you can start really jockeying for position and trying to get it perfect. But as a new racer, you know, just make sure that you're you're doing the right thing and sail conservatively. Um, and as always, you're con constantly needing to evaluate where you're at if there's any wind shifts where competition is and sort of taking that plan that you've had and start modifying it. Maybe you're not as quick. Maybe you're somewhere you got you know to the left end of the line quicker than you thought and you need to uh, plan on how to slow things down. Okay, so now we're jumping ahead two minutes. So again, as, as we noted, there is no three, there's no warning at three, there is no warning at two. Uh, everything just continues on until you get to one. Um, at one, there's gonna be a long sound of the horn and long is really, you know, it's a second, two seconds. It's, it's more than just a quick blast um, is what you're listening for. And at this point, that P flag, which is the, the blue and white flag, is lowered. So only your section flag will be up. Um, and this lets you know that you have one minute to start. And at this point, things are getting pretty organized. Um, you know, before this, boats are kind of sailing all over the place. It's somewhat chaotic. Um, but at the one minute flag, people start uh, really making their approach and start accelerating to the line. Um, you know, again, you know, look at where you are, figure out how that comes into the plan, and maybe you need to come up with a new plan to get back to the line. Maybe you're too close to the line and you need to bleed some speed, um, but really you need to start executing those final maneuvers um, in order to get to the start. And, and again, as new racers, um, my recommendation, you know, we're not really going to talk about strategy and stuff here, but my recommendation would aim to start somewhere in the middle of the line maybe 10 seconds late. And if you can, make sure that you're on starboard tack. That way, you know, you've got plenty of room, no one's gonna push you out the corner, you've got right of way and you can just do your own thing. Um, so you're gonna keep, you know, accelerating towards the line, ex executing the final bits of that plan for the last minute. And then um, there will be another blast of the horn. Your section flag will come down. Um, the next section flag will go up and you've started, you are clear to cross the start line at that point. Um, so, you know, the line will look very much like what's going on here. This is probably moments before uh, this star boat start um, and everybody is off and running. You know, again, I, I can't stress it enough. The goal is to hit that start line where you want at zero at maximum speed. Um, as a new racer, you can probably be a little less aggressive to make sure that you're safe, but that's really the goal here. And really, I guess, really the overarching goal is don't hit anybody. Um, but that should go without saying. Okay, so we've started the race. Um, some things may happen afterwards. Um, occasionally, someone crossed early. Sometimes a lot of people cross early, um, especially if you and if you've had the opportunity to participate in or watch a race involving the T10 fleet. Um, those guys are super aggressive, and it's not uncommon for them to do a recall because someone was over early. Uh, as a new racer, this is why you kind of want to be conservative because you don't get want to get caught out early. Um, so there is a procedure if someone's over early that you need to be aware of. Uh, and there's really two ways it can happen. It'll be an individual recall um, or a general recall. So the individual recall is maybe one, maybe two boats were over early. 
uh, the race committee, they'll blast their horn uh, once and they're gonna put up an, the X flag, which doesn't look like an X, it's a blue, uh, blue cross on a white field. Uh, that'll go up. Ideally, race committee will, will hail the sale numbers of the people over early to let them know that they're the ones over early. Um, this is not required. So if you feel that you might've been over early, you might wanna duck back. Um, so again, radio announcements are courtesies only on the race course. Uh, race committees are generally nice people and they'll try to help you out, but uh, just keep this in mind. Um, if you are recalled, if you were early, you need to go back behind the line and restart. So your entire boat needs to get to the pre-start side of the line, and then you can start again. And one thing to keep in mind is while you're heading back, you need to avoid everybody else. You have no right of way rights um, other than needing to, you know, people need to try to not hit you, but you have no rights. So, um, you know, do the best you can to get out of the way and turn around. But, you know, you if you're in the middle of the fleet, you can't expect to just flip a 180 and turn around because uh, you're going to be right in, in the way of a lot of people. Um, at times, uh, the start was sort of a mess and you can have, you know, half the fleet was over early or something like that, um, or it was too hard for race committee to judge who was over early. And in that case, they'll issue what's called the general recall. And that'll have this first substitute flag, which is the, the blue and yellow triangles. Um, and they'll put that up with two blasts. And basically what this means is it's a do over for everybody. Um, so everybody needs to come back behind the line. Uh, race committee will probably issue some instructions via the radio, um, but at a minimum, when that flag comes down, it means you have one minute to the warning. Um, any subsequent sequences, so if there's, you know, if this happens on a um, a section right before you, it just means that your section is going to be delayed until this one gets off. So it's not like their section gets pushed to the end of the day. Um, it's just everything sort of goes on pause, and uh, that start sequence is restarted again. Hopefully this doesn't happen. And, and for the most part in, you know, distance races and, and some of the, the slower fleets, these are less common. These are just really super common, especially in very highly competitive fleets that you'll have a, a general recall. Okay. Um, so what we've covered at this point is sort of the most common things. When you're out there, there might be a few other signals dealing with flags that you need to be aware of though. Uh, so we're not gonna spend a ton of time here. So the first one is postponement flag. Um, that's sort of this this candy cane striped flag that you see over here. Um, the idea is is any races that have not started yet, so in particular in buoy races where there'll be a majority uh, of several races in a day, um, it means that they're postponed. They're not canceled, but we're you know they'll put it up if there's not enough wind to start. Uh, they'll put it up if they need to change the course or something like that, um, just to let everybody know to sort of hang tight. Um, you know there'll be two sounds up when it goes up, and then one sound when it comes down, which would you know, well, means we're getting back into sequence. Again, race committee will do a great job with you of explaining exactly what's going on and what to expect, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, and you'll see that one sometimes out on, on the water, like I said, especially with buoy races if they have to adjust the course and things like that. Um, one flag you won't see as frequently, but you may come across is the abandonment flag. Uh, typically race committee does a good job of checking the weather. Um, so if it's gonna be, you know, blowing 50 knots and eight foot swells, they'll let you know um, via email or something like that before you even leave the harbor that they're abandoning for the day. But there are you know, times that conditions uh, become problematic or there might be some other issue out on the water and race committee needs to abandon the race. And that means that um, all races period are over. Um, there's a couple different nuances here that we won't get into, but the idea is if you see this checkered flag, um, races are pretty much over for the day. Listen to your radio for announcements. There will be some uh, some sounds on the uh, on the horn to let you know it's going up. Um, the next one is course change and shorten. Um, you'll see these less frequently in distance races, uh, but certainly in buoy races you'll see it. And again, this is if you know conditions have changed for some reason and race committee needs to send you on a shorter course, or race committee um, needs to you know change from course one to course two or whatever. Um, they'll fly one of these flags. Uh, they'll make some sounds with their horns, especially if it's a distance race and they're you know changing you to a short course. They'll likely get on a radio so people know what's going on. Um, but again, you can't depend on that. So try and pay attention the best you can um, if they're shortening course. And any of that shorted course error information will probably be in 
your uh, SIs, it might be in amendments, uh, things like that. So you can check to what's going on. Um, and the last one um, you'll hopefully see every time you come out is the, the L flag. This is the come to me. So this they'll probably have this up in the pre-race time when they're trying to get people checked in. Uh, certainly during buoy races, they'll have it up be, uh, before and between races to let you know the details of the course that's about to be sailed. Um, but basically it just means, hey, come nearby, I've got something to tell you. Um, and you should respect that if you see it up or, or hear them make the associated announcement on a radio. Okay, not seeing a ton of new questions in the chat. So we will keep on soldiering along here. Um, so at this point, we've, we're on the race, we're started, but we need to know where we're going. What's that race course gonna look like? So we'll run through some of those real basic things of, of what you're looking for on the day of the race. So the first thing to understand, um, and you'll probably understand this when you're actually registering for the race, is uh, there's different types of races and they more or less fall into two categories. So the first one is your distance race. Sometimes they're called random legs, sometimes they're called port to port. Um, the idea here is you're gonna be sailing um, quite a long ways, you know, sometimes 25 miles in an afternoon. Some of these races, like the Mac race is 330 miles. Um, so, you know, there would typically just be one race of the day because it'll probably take several hours, if not several days. Um, and the race is more about where you're going. It's not technical up and down wind or something like that. So you're really going to, you should expect to see all points of sail. So you're going to be reaching, running, uh, you'll be beating at some point. So understand, you know, what you're getting into there. Um, and again, it, it's typically, you're just gonna have one start because the race is gonna last all day long. Um, I would suggest for, for new sailors, this, this is probably the direction you wanna go is stick with distance races. I know all the, um, the casual races that CASRA puts on are typically distance races because they're a little bit easier to handle. They're a little less technical. Um, but for those of you that are, you know, moving along a little faster and, and want a different challenge, there are buoy races. Um, these are, you know, like I said, slightly more technical. Um, typically they're, you know, only a couple miles long, one or two miles in length. You might sell multiple legs. You may go up and down a few times. Um, and there's various shapes. So instead of, you know, sailing straight to Mackinac Island, you might just be sailing, you know, upwind for two miles and then back. Um, and you might do that several times. Um, but there's a whole bunch of different shapes. There's windward lures, there's trapezoids, there's triangles. Um, and your sailing instructions will explain exactly what you should expect along that. Um, and the fun thing about buoy races is because the, you know, you're know you only sailing a few miles at a time, uh, oftentimes you get three, four races in in a day, which is kind of fun. Um, so I wanna quick talk about what the, the finish and start lines look like. Um, this is something that is uh, generally pretty well prescribed in the race uh, instructions. It's it's more or less the same if you were racing here in Chicago or you wanted to go uh, you know, racing in New Zealand, it's gonna be the same thing. And actually, if you're watching the America's Cup, which was, I guess, canceled this weekend, but um, you, know, you look at their start line, it's more or less the same idea. Um, a couple of common elements that you're always gonna see, there's always some sort of signal boat. It's oftentimes the same as the committee boat um, that's gonna be over on the right side of the line uh, for the start line in particular. And then there's gonna be some sort of buoy off to the side of them and as we mentioned, everything's handled with flags. So um, when you're looking at the line in the uh, in the start configuration, uh, the line is is the imaginary line between some sort of buoy. Um, I usually prefer it to be an orange buoy, but it doesn't have to be orange. It can be white. It can be yellow. It can be red. Usually, it's it's a pretty obvious uh, floating mark. Um, and it'll be between that and an orange flag on the race committee boat. And if if you're paying attention to race committee and you can kind of see it the image here, um, you know, someone will be standing lined up with their eyes right between that orange flag and the buoy, just paying attention to, you know, who's ahead and behind of the line. Uh, the width, width of it is also prescribed. It's typically 1.1 to 1.5 times the sum of the length of the boats in the fleet. Um, so, you know, if you think about it and you're sailing in a, in a fleet of, you know, 30 foot boats and there's 10 of them, that makes the line wider than a football field. Um, just something to keep in mind. So it can be quite wide. So when you show up, you know, it's not like the start mark is going to be right next to the boat. It could be a little ways away. Um, and in this image, it's kind of hard to see if you can see my cursor. Over here is the buoy. And this, you know, this is your orange flag. So it's, you know, this is a T10 fleet. There's probably 15 boats on the line. 
it's a quite a ways that they have to start. Um, you also will have obviously a finish line. Um, one thing to note is that, especially if you're doing a distance race, the start and finish line may not be in the same place. You know, this is pretty obvious again with, with the Mac or the tri-state where you're sailing to a whole nother city. Um, but even in the city of Chicago, I know the pursuit of happiness race we did last year, um, the start was downtown and the finish was near 31st street. So um, pay attention to your SIs to know where it is. Um, but more often than not, the start line and the finish line are basically in the same spot. Um, sometimes they, you know, they'll, they'll have both of them set up at once, especially for uh, some buoy races for convenience. But the start line is defined as the line between some sort of buoy and a blue flag in the signal boat. So if you're coming into a finish and you see the, you see buoys on either side of the signal boat, um, and you don't know which side to go on, look for the blue flag. You go on that side of the boat. Um, so we've mentioned a lot of different buoys, and there are tons of them. And really, when we were thinking about this course, we broke them into two types of groups. So one of those sort of inflatables, temporary type uh, marks. And you know these are the types of ones you're going to see out there. There's tetrahedrons, teardrops, tomatoes, which is kind of confusing because tomatoes aren't always orange, but it's a big round ball is the idea. Uh, they're cylinders, and and these things are usually you know three, four, or five feet. They're pretty obvious. Um, and a new one that I know Corinthians been using lately is mark set bots, which are basically drones that'll go out there. Um, and it's neat because race committee can use an app to reposition things. That's really helpful for buoy marks. So um, keep an eye out for those mark set bots because you're going to be seeing more and more of them for the next few years. Um, here in Chicago, we're fortunate that we have a whole lot of fixed marks. Uh, so typical ones that you're going to see, you know, you've got government buoys. Uh, we should all be pretty familiar with what those look like. It's, you know, bell buoys, lighted buoys. Um, there's also a couple of racing circles. When we get into some of the local knowledge stuff, we'll talk about where those are. Um, but more or less, you know, those look like, you know, they're five, six inch round pieces of PVC that stick up a few feet um, that are sometimes used. Um, and then there's the really big obvious ones uh, that are used and those are the water intake cribs. Uh, we'll talk about uh, what, what special circumstances you have from those, but those are more or less the fixed marks. Um, for the, ex with the exception of racing circles, uh, these are gonna show up in your charting, chart plotter. Um, you know, the government buoys and water intake cribs especially. What I've done on my boat is I went through all of the sort of fixed racing circles and I plugged all those locations into my chart plotter. So if I see the morning of a race that they're gonna be using one of those, I can just select it and I don't have to mess around with trying to, you know, add and delete uh, different points from my chart plotter for the day. Um, so we know what our marks look like and, you know, how do we round them? And this is something that on its face seems simple, but we need to make sure we're doing it uh, correctly. So, you know, it's, it's, again, most of these things are pretty obvious, but it's, it's worth saying. Um, your SIs will tell you if there's any special things. But the idea is that, um, you know, if there's nothing listed as far as if you're turning left or right around a mark, the idea is you're, you're rounding to port. Um, and, you know, we all love sailing, but, um, you know, sailing likes to use sort of esoteric words. So we're not, you know, just saying turn left. We're not just saying turn right. Oh, we're saying port rounding or starboard rounding. Port is turn left, starboard is turn right um, around that mark. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, if you are sailing around a crib, um, it's not just the physical crib you need to, to make your way around, but there's going to be a series of small white buoys. Uh, those are government guard marks. Um, I've never seen the Coast Guard come out, but theoretically, if you go inside it, the Coast Guard can come out and yell at you. So uh, you want to stay outside of those. And another competitor could protest you if you go inside those. So when you're rounding the cribs, stay outside the guard marks. Um, rounding buoys is obviously particularly important when you're talking about buoy racing. Um, so, you know, for the, the purposes of this presentation, we'll just talk about a, a windward lured type of race setup. There's a bunch of other ones, but this is sort of the more common. Um, so just some terminology, the windward mark is what's up here. It's the one that's closer to the wind. Uh, the leeward mark is, you know, gonna be either the start finish line or potentially uh, there will be, if you're doing multiple legs, there will be some marks uh, further downwind that aren't the start finish line. Um, this will all be described in detail in your sailing instructions, so make sure you understand that. Um, and then the other thing to pay attention is there's 
it's not just going to be one mark and another mark. Sometimes there's multiple marks out there and it can be confusing. So when you're sailing up to that windward mark, something to pay attention to is it might be a mark and then there might be another small buoy um, a ways off, more or less perpendicular to the race course. Um, that's an offset mark and you also need to go around that. The idea there is, um, especially windward marks with people trying to set spinnakers and things like that, it can get kind of chaotic and an offset mark is used to control traffic. So the idea is you'll come up, you'll you know hang a left and basically go on a reach for a little bit to get out of the way before you can turn down. Um, when you're looking at leeward marks, if there is a rounding, um, it could be just a single mark, in which case you round it to port or starboard, depending on what uh, it tells you. But frequently you'll see what's referred to as a gate, and it's a setup kind of like we have shown here, where it'll be two drop marks. Um, all you need to know is that you need to sail between them. Um, whether you round a port or starboard doesn't matter, just go between them and go around the outside. Um, it just helps, you know, people who are making strategic decisions might think that one side's better than the other. Uh, for whatever reason, it gives you that opportunity. Um, so typically on a, on a windward leeward course, you're going to start the race, head upwind. You'll probably have to tack upwind. Um, you'll take a port rounding around the mark and the offset, so there'll be some reaching going on. You'll come back down, and if it's multiple legs, you'll see a gate. Oops. And then you can go left or right, port or starboard, around that gate. You come back upwind, tacking the whole way go around again, and then you can come back down to the start finish line. Um, and again, uh, you know, this will all be explained in the sailing instructions for you. Um, so we will now talk about sort of some of the, the local knowledge things to keep an eye out for things that might show up um, when you're looking at race courses. So uh, this is this is a JPY centric uh, webinar. So you know, our beer can racing area is a little bit different than a lot of people. So we race off of the end of Casino Pier, which is right here. Um, one change to the start line that you would see if you raced it out of Jackson Park is the committee boat's actually on the left side and it, the start line is between the committee boat and the end of the pier. Um, that way it just saves them time from every Wednesday having to set up marks. Um, and that's all actually explained. If you read through the SIs for our beer cans, it's explained in there. Um, and then JPYC typically uses different uh, government marks for our Wednesday night courses. Um, and even if you're not a JPYC racer, uh, if you're doing a, uh, a distance race, you will commonly have to sail down here, um, especially, you know, JPYC hosted races. We usually try to get people to sail to the south side because we love it so much. Um, so things that you need to be familiar with that might be called out in your sailing instructions. Uh, the first and the most obvious is the 68th Street Crib. Um, there's an image of it right there for you. It's two big buildings. Uh, again, white guard marks around it, stay outside of those. Um, pretty obvious to see it's the biggest structure on the south side. Um, there's also the number four bell buoy, also referred to the Clemson Shoal buoy. Um, that shows up up here. Uh, it's marking the end of the Clemson Shoal. Um, I see Dale Smurls on here. He's probably the only guy in this call that ever needs to worry about depth um, around the Clemson Shoal. It's really, you know, it shows eight feet here, especially with the lake so high, it's not an issue. Um, for depth there, but sometimes people have have you sail around that. Um, there's a few lesser known buoys. They're not bell buoys and they're not lighted, but they're also out here just as government marks. So try not to be confused. Make sure you're looking for the bell with the light if they're sending you to the Clemson Shoal um, and not these smaller number four, and number six buoys. Um, and then just something in general that all sailors should know if they're sailing onto the south side is um, about Morgan Shoal. So Chicago's main shipwreck is actually on Morgan Shoal. It's still there from 100 years ago. Um, it's right here. It gets super shallow. There is a red nun buoy uh, marking it, the number two buoy. Just make sure that you're staying, uh, you're keeping your boat east of there, because if you go west, you can get in some trouble. Um, it gets mighty shallow. Like I said, you know, 100 years ago, a boat did crash in there, and the boiler and the, uh, and the, the propeller are still actually in the water. So. If you're sailing on the south side, stay to the west, keep outside of that, at least until you get to promontory point, and then you're pretty much okay. Um, the next area moving on north is downtown. So this is where the majority of races in Chicago will take place. A um, couple of notable pieces on here. We talked about racing circles. Um, the the more, most common one, I would say, is the SA7 course. This is the one that 
Columbia, Chicago, and Burnham Park used for their Wednesday night races. And it's a series of buoys uh, making an octagon out uh, just a couple miles off of Dorther the Island. There's a center buoy named SA7. And the idea here is all these buoys are about a mile apart. And so they can make any sort of course they need um, for a buoy race using this racing circle. But oftentimes they're sometimes used for, uh, for distance races as well. So be aware of what you're looking for. And those so, like they're red and white candy canes about five, six inches in diameter. They'll stick up a couple feet out of the water. Um, there's also the SA4 racing area that you might see in your sailing instructions. There is no buoy for this, more or less just describes the area um, that's about a mile southeast of the harbor entrance where the majority of CASRA races in particular get started. So it's just generally describing this area. Uh, CASRA does a fantastic job of always using the same uh, buoy for, or not buoy, but the same location for their starts. Uh, so you kind of know where you're heading. And usually when you're heading to, to the start of a race, uh, you'll see the committee boat there. You'll see a bunch of other boats sort of milling about, you know where you're going. Um, and then there's the two cribs on the north side. So you've got the four mile crib and the Harris Deaver crib. Um, here's images of both of them. The Deaver is always very obvious. It's two buildings. One of them's dressed up like a candy cane. Uh, four miles a little more uh, discreet, but you know these things are so hard to miss. Um, you are all probably very aware of them. And again, you can't be stressed enough. To stay outside of the buoys when you're going around them. North side, um, I'm a little less familiar up there because it's a bit of a haul from Jackson Park, but um, Corinthian has set up a set of racing, you know, permanent racing marks up there. So they have their own circle uh, that's shown here. It's, you know, set up for the cardinal directions of the, of the, uh, of the compass. Uh, there are also some sort of further out markers that they use for distance races. So, um, you know, again, these will be described in your SIs, but know that they're there. Um, their marks are white uh, sticks. They're not candy canes. So just a uh, little bit different thing you're looking out for for when you're out there. Um, and the center mark is really, it's, it's just east of Montrose Harbor, as you can see here. Um, there is also the Wilson crib that's in the middle of it all. It's the smallest of the cribs. It's actually inactive, but uh, nonetheless, you know, give it a wide berth, make your way around it. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is some of these beaches um, along the north side have piers and things that stick out quite a ways into the lake um, that are partially submerged. I know every year you end up seeing a power motor or two get stuck on one. Um, so don't be that guy. If you can avoid it, you know, give, give the shore a wide berth. So the next section we're going to cover are the racing rules of sailing. The racing rules of sailing are a set of international rules that govern the conduct and management of races. Uh, the main racing rules of sailing are published by the World Sailing, which is an international authority on set for sail racing. Granted, there are a number of national authorities that can add their own prescription and appendices to these. For example, U.S. Sailing is the national authority for the United States. Uh, what's kind of important about the racing rules is saying they are updated every four years following a Summer Olympics year. Granted, 2020 should have been a Summer Olympics year. Um, so the current version for the racing rules of saying is now the 2021-2024 racing rules of sailing. Uh, the idea is that the various sailing authorities, for example, World Sailing or U.S. Sailing, will then provide, say, previews and updates to what changes might happen in the next set of rules uh, prior to that version year. And then the idea is that those rules are then set for that four-year period. If there are any changes or modifications that any of the sailing authorities think that should be done to the racing rules of sailing, those would basically be proposed and held to the, then, the next version. So if, for example, there were changes they wanted to make based upon what they see how these current version of the rules are doing, those changes would not take effect until 2025 in that case, so that during this period from 2021, 2024, the rules are basically set. So how do you obtain a copy of the current racing rules of sailing? Uh, one of the easiest ways to obtain it is from U.S. Sailing. So you can go to their website, uh, www.ussailing.org. There is a racing rules app that is available for either iOS or Android. Granted, it does require an active U.S. Sailing membership. Uh, you can purchase a hard copy, uh, one that is paper or waterproof from their website. Uh, one thing, though, is any U.S. prescriptions and appendices are also available as a separate PDF from their website. Another way to get the racing rules of sailing is you can download a PDF from World Sailing. So sailing.org is the main website for the World Sailing. <clears throat> if you go, go there to their website and click in, on technical in their menu, 
and then click on Documents and Rules. If you select the Racing Rules of Sailing, it'll give you a little pop-up that kind of looks like this, where they would have the Racing Rules of Sailing, for example, 2021, 2024. And if you click on this link, 2021 to 2024 World Sailing Racing Rules of World Sailing Racing Rules of Sailing, this would give you a PDF of the current uh, Racing Rules of Sailing. At that point, then you can probably download the prescriptions and appendices for the from U.S. Sailing from their website, and then you would have the documents to have <clears throat> the current version of the Racing Rules of Sailing. Um, if you want to obtain a hard copy of the current Racing Rules of Sailing, again, like I said, you can go to U.S. Sailing. So ussailing.org. If you click on competition, rules and officiating, and then racing rules, so I have a little animation, competition, racing rules. And you can see here they have links for the racing rules of sailing 2021 20, 20, to 2024, and as well as a link for any U.S. prescriptions for those rules. In terms of the organization of the racing rules of sailing, uh, there's a number of definitions that are at the at the beginning of the racing rules of sailing to define some of the terms that are used during the racing rules of sailing some of the basic principles in terms of uh the i guess uh philosophy behind the racing rules of sailing the basic principles governing the racing rules of sailing and then there's a number of main parts the fundamental rules when boats meet the conduct of a race uh, other requirements etc entering qualification there are also a number of appendices that could have some uh, information that we apply to that. For example, some key appendices, Appendix A, uh, details a uh, scoring system. The low point scoring system, which you might hear about, is actually detailed in Appendix A of the Racing Rules of Sailing. Uh, for example, if there's some sort of remote control or radio sailing, there's actually an Appendix E that has specific rules to that. Uh, Appendix J will have some templates of the notice of race or sailing instructions. So, for example, the documents that Luke talked about at the beginning part of this section or, or this session today. Uh, those notice of race and sailing instructions actually have a common template that most organizing authorities would use, and Appendix J has those templates. Um, and there's, for example, uh, in dinghy sailing, one uh, kind of starting system that's often used is called this audible signal racing system, and that's, for example, detailed in Appendix U. Uh, so there's a number of kind of like add-ons that come to the racing rules of sailing. Now, one of the key definitions when we talk about a rule, and this is the definition that comes from the racing rules of sailing, is a rule defines, well, first off, is any rules that are in this book, anything that's in the racing rules of sailing themselves. Uh, some other important things is prescriptions by the national authority. So the idea is the racing rules of sailing that come from world sailing is kind of the foundation. And then upon that, the different authorities can add or amend to that or basically add prescriptions. And so the national authorities, for example, U.S. Sailing, might add prescriptions or amendments, if you will, to that base of the racing rules of sailing. Classes, for example, if you have boats that might be in the T-10 class or J-105, they might have specific class rules that would also define how the races are being conducted. Uh, any notice of race can actually have additional rules that could govern that particular race. And so that kind of, again, builds upon the idea as we have the base racing rules of sailing. We might have prescriptions. If you're in the T-10 class, <clears throat> excuse me, there might be rules related to how the T-10 class rates. In a particular race, there might be rules related to the notice of race as well as the sailing instructions and any other documents that govern that event. And so when you look, for example, in definitions in the racing rule of sailing, when they talk about a rule or the enforcement of a rule, it basically applies to any of these where the rules might be. And so what's really important is you want to kind of know the racing rules of sailing, but also be aware of there could be other rules that will add on that. And what are those particular rules and where would I find those? So in terms of the racing rules of sailing, probably the number one rule, and this is racing rule number one, is safety. Uh, there's basically two components. Number one is they helping those in danger. So a boat or competitor or support person shall give all possible help to any person or vessel in danger. And in some ways, this kind of mirrors the, the idea we're in a maritime environment. Um, it can be dangerous, and so we want to help those that are in danger, uh, providing aid as possible. Uh, number two, I think, is the second point in safety is really important is life-saving equipment and, and personal flotation devices. A boat shall carry adequate life-saving equipment for all persons on board. In reality, this really reflects, for example, a Coast Guard rule. And so this is not anything different than if you just had a boat that's on the water. You know, the Coast Guard regulations is whether or not they're racing or they're just on the water, you shall have adequate, you know, personal flotation devices for everyone on board. 
Related to that, though, is a very important, is each competitor is individually responsible for wearing the personal flotation device for those particular conditions. Now, there might be changes to this. For example, I know in the MAC race and some of the instructions, there are specific requirements on what sort of um, personal flotation devices and safety equipment that you must have at certain times. But really, if you look at the base of the racing rules of sailing, they're basically saying that it's your responsibility to make sure that you are safe and that you have your adequate safety gear. In the second rule in terms of overall sailing is fair sailing. So racing rule number two is fair sailing. A boat and her owner shall compete in compliance with recognized principles of sportsmanship and fair play. Um, we want racing to be fun. We want to be fair competitors. And I think when we start looking at some of these rules that we have in the racing rule of sailing, a lot of it might harken back to this principle. Uh, we want to have a fair event. We want to have this kind of fair Corinthian spirit, if you will. Um, so we want to be out there and competing fairly. Um, so good sportsmanship, fair play is always important. The next two main rules in the racing rule of sailing are three and four. Number three, the responsibility for a boat decision to participate in a race or continue racing is hers alone. So basically the onus is then on the boat themselves to decide whether or not they race. It's their decision, their decision alone. You can decide to race, you can decide not to race, you can withdraw. It's your responsibility to make that decision, no one else's. Uh, related to that is racing rule number four, the acceptance of the rules. And this is kind of important, is by participating or intending to participate in any event conducted under, these, under the rules, each competitor and boat owner agrees to accept the rules. And so in many cases with any of these races, and there's a number of documents in terms of what the rules are and what's going to govern that, uh, acceptance of saying, I'm going to accept that I'm going to compete under these rules and, you know, conduct the race under these rules and agree to be held accountable to any sort of penalties that might be associated with those rules. As soon as you basically show up to the race course, you said that I'm, I'm accepting these rules, or if you intend to participate in that event, you've decided that I'm going to accept the rules of that event. Uh, there's no legal piece of paper that you have to sign or anything like that, basically intending to participate or showing up and participating is, is basically you have decided that you accept the rules of that event and you're going to participate according to those rules. So kind of a quick summary of the basic racing rules of sailing. Like I said, it's published by World Sailing. This is an international sailing organization. So the idea is that these are rules that are applicable everywhere in the world. Granted, national authorities, for example, U.S. Sailing, can add prescriptions onto that. Local authorities, class organizations, yacht clubs, race organizers can add various rules, be these class rules or notice of race or sailing instructions that can amend those rules. So be care, you know, be mindful of what is out there. Uh, these are published every and updated every four years. Sometimes the updates are small, sometimes the updates are large, and so it's always important to know that if every four years you might want to check to see what are the changes that might be coming to the racing rules of sailing. There were some changes that actually happened in the 2021, and it's important to know how that might affect how races are being conducted. And again, these are happening after a Summer Olympics, so 2020 would have been a Summer Olympics, thus the new set of rules start in 2021. And I can't iterate this enough. The most important rules of any race are safety, so being safe on the, on the race course, and number two, being uh, fair in the sailing. So we want to have a fair race, a competitive race, but we want it to be fair. The next section we're going to talk about is when boats meet. And so this is racing rules part two, and this covers rules 10 through 23. And so this governs basically, if we look at this, this governs when boats are going to be close, in essence, close to each other, who has the right of way, who, who, for example, can do what they need to do. And so these are the rules that apply to that. And the rules of part two apply when boats are, that are sailing are in or near the racing area, intend to race, are racing, or have been racing. So basically, if you're in that area and you are intending to race or racing or just have finished, the rules of part two are still going to apply to you. What's really important, though, is when a boat sailing under these rules meet a vessel that is not, so in essence, another vessel that's out on the water, that boat shall comply with any government right-of-way right of way rules. So if you are on the race course and you have port and starboard, or say you're on the starboard tech, and you come upon a vessel who is not racing, you have to apply, you have to basically use, comply any sort of government right-of-way rules, which mean, mean they have the right-of-way, not necessarily you, even though you might be, say, on a starboard tack in the middle of a race. I'll give one example. I think uh, I was once starboating in 
uh, Lake Peoria, and there's actually, it's part of the Illinois River system. And we were on a race, and one thing we always had to keep mindful of is the barges going up and down the river. Why? They have the right of way over us. So even though we're in a race, we have to make sure that we obey any government right of way rules. So these rules, basically, that we see in racing are added upon whatever governmental right of way rules might be there, but then are only really governing the behavior of the boats that are part of that race. The main rules for when a boat, when boats meet the right of way. So the definition of right of way is the idea is when one of the boat is required to keep clear. And so really when you see the rules that are in the racing rules of sailing, they will say that a boat must keep clear of another boat. There are some limitations to these in terms of what are the actions that a right of way boat can do. But in many cases, you'll see that the language is such and such boat will, shall keep clear of such and such other boat. And these kind of break down into four classes, if we will. The first one is rule 10 on opposite tacks. So if you have two boats that are on opposite tack, and we'll talk about that in a second, the port tack boat shall keep clear of the starboard tack boat. So you'll hear this starboard over port, basically. Number Rule number 11, on the same tack, if they're overlapped, so if two boats are on the same tack, the wind is coming over the same side on each of those boats, the windward boat shall keep clear of a leeward boat if they're overlapped. If they're not overlapped, this is rule 12, and they're on the same tack, then a boat clear of stern shall keep clear of a boat that's clear ahead. Um, and then number 13 is kind of important. While tacking, after a boat passes head to wind, she shall keep clear of other boats until she is on a close hold course. And so when you're in the middle of a maneuver, the right-of-way rules that might apply, say either if you are an opposite tack, don't apply until basically you are in the close hold, you're on course, and now you're sailing away. If you're in the middle of your tack, you basically have to make sure that you keep clear of everyone while you're making your maneuver. So that first one on opposite tacks, rule 10. When boats are on opposite tacks, a port tack shall keep clear of a starboard tack boat. And so here we have kind of a depiction. We have the wind arrow coming down here, so the wind's coming down from this way. We have this boat where the wind is coming over the starboard side of the boat, so this is a starboard tack boat. And we have the wind that's coming over this side of the boat, so this is a port tack boat. And so this boat, port tack boat must keep clear of the starboard tack boat. The starboard tack is basically the right to go where they need to go in terms of their course. And this boat has to do, the, do whatever maneuvers she must do to basically keep clear of that boat so that boat can basically go on along its way. If we look here, we also have the instance here that these boats are going downwind, but again, this boat, if we look, the windward side of the boat, the side of the boat where the wind is coming over is basically the port side of the boat. So this port, boat is on a port tack. Sometimes you might hear the port jive when they're going downwind, but it's basically in terms of the racing rules of sailing, they call it a port tack. <clears throat> and this boat is on starboard tack. This is the starboard side of the boat and the wind is coming over the starboard side. And again, this boat would have to keep clear of this boat. So as they're coming towards this, say, meeting right here, this boat would have to either maybe duck around behind or potentially jive over to keep clear of the where this boat is going. And so this is probably maybe one of the first rules, most important rules is starboard over port. And so port tack boat shall keep clear of a starboard tack boat. The next one is, for example, if you have boats that are on the same tack, this idea of overlap. So in the racing rules of sailing, the definition of overlap is basically built upon the definition of whether or not a boat is clear ahead or clear astern. And so one boat is considered clear astern of another boat. When her hull and equipment in the normal position are behind a line, a beam from the aftmost point of the other boat's hull and equipment in normal position, the other boat is clear ahead. A clear ahead. They overlap when neither is clear astern. So if I give this example here, here's two boats going downwind. I have this blue boat, and here is a line, a beam of the aft, aftmost part of that boat. And if you look at that line, it basically does not intersect with any of the boat, or any of the equipment, the hull or equipment on this boat. And so this purple boat is clear astern. This blue boat would be considered clear ahead of this boat, of this purple boat. And so there is no overlap. Now, if we look at this situation, we have a blue boat and the yellow boat. The aftmost position, if we draw an imaginary line, a beam, so basically perpendicular to the center line of the yellow boat, it intersects basically here or crosses over on the blue boat. And so these two boats are now overlapped. So they have an overlap situation and they'll have to deal with 
uh, dealing with that overlap, we now have a windward and a leeward boat, and so the rights would apply here. In this particular case, because they have clear astern and clear ahead, then the clear ahead versus clear astern would apply. And again, here we have another boat that this orange boat, we can see that this boat is clear ahead of the yellow boat in this case, as well as the blue boat and the purple boat in that particular case. This is just showing in another example where the boats are going upwind, and so these boats are close hauled, and we have basically a boat that's clear ahead. Again, this l imaginary line that is a beam perpendicular to the center line of the boat that's at the aftmost position does not intersect with anything or cross over any of the boat or equipment of any of these boats. So this is a clear ahead of this boat as well as that boat as well as that boat. These two boats are overlapped because, as you can see, this imaginary line that's at the aftmost position of the boat does intersect at some point with the yellow boat or crosses over the yellow boat. And so these two boats are now overlapped. And this purple boat is clear astern of everyone. So one kind of complication to that is with the overlap is, however, two boats can be considered overlap when a boat between them overlaps both. And so basic, and these terms always apply to boats that are only on the same tack. Again, they have to be on the same tack. So again, you see these boats and this boat, for example, here, it's on the port tack, port tack, port tack, the wind's all coming over the same side. If there was one boat that was had the wind on a different side, overlap, we don't we don't think about overlap because they're not on the same tack. And at that point, uh, starboard over port comes into a play. So a port tack boat must keep clear of a starboard tack boat if they're on opposite tacks. If they're on the same tack, then you have to figure out if they have overlap or not. And in this situation, if we if we kind of imaginally imagine imagine that the yellow boat didn't wasn't there, you could see that this blue line, this, this imaginary line that's a beam of the aftmost position of the blue boat, does not intersect anywhere with the orange boat. And so these, in theory, these two would be clear ahead and clear astern. However, we have the yellow boat that's in between, and so there's an overlap between the yellow boat and the orange boat. We can see the imaginary lines intersect. We can see that there's an overlap between the blue boat and the yellow boat. And so we have an over, uh, basically a stacking overlap position. And in this case, we consider that the orange that there is an overlap between the blue and the orange boat because there is a boat in between them that overlaps them both and so this is a basically kind of a stacked overlap so this boat is considered overlaps with this boat because of the intermediary boat and we can see there's a situation here where they're basically all going downwind again we have a series of overlaps and so this boat is considered the blue boat is considered overlap with the yellow boat in that particular case so when they're overlapped and on the same tack, if or if, if they're on the same tack, so if they are overlapped, a windward boat shall keep clear of a leeward boat. And so if we look here, here's the situation. We have this blue boat and this yellow boat. They are overlapped. Again, we can look at the imaginary line. That's a beam of the aftmost position of the boat, and it's intersecting here. And so this is the windward boat. This is the boat that is closer to the wind than the leeward boat. And so the windward boat shall keep clear of the leeward boat. Likewise, we can see these two boats are going downwind. This boat here, for example, again, they have overlap. This is the windward boat. It's closer to the wind than the leeward boat. In some ways, and this is kind of how maybe I rationalize this, if you can imagine it, this windward boat has clear air. Basically, they should be able to head up if they want. They can basically go anywhere they want. They're getting the full effect of the wind, if you will. The leeward boat is now sitting in the shadow of this windward boat, and so they kind of have a a limitation on what they're able to do because they have this boat sitting on top of it. And so thus, this leeward boat should basically have the right of way. This windward boat should keep clear of them because this leeward boat should be able to go where it needs to, and it's basically at a disadvantage because it's getting blanketed by the windward boat, if you think about it in the situation. Like I said, that's kind of how I rationalize in the mind why this rule makes sense or why this rule would work. You might have your own way, but that's the one way to think about it. When they're not overlapped, when a boat is clear astern, a boat clear astern shall keep clear of a boat that's clear ahead. So this boat, for example, is clear ahead, clear astern, right? This line is not intersecting. And so the clear astern boat shall keep clear of the boat that's clear ahead. Again, clear astern, clear ahead. I mean, you could think about this. I rationalize this, right? This is kind of like, you know, if I'm driving in a car, I can't rear end the person in front of me. Same my kind of idea. It's like I have to keep clear of people who are in front of me driving and then I'm clear ahead, and they are clear ahead of me. And so if I'm clear astern of another boat, I have to keep clear of them. They may not see me coming up on them, but I should probably be able to see where I'm going in terms of if I'm overtaking this boat, for example. I, if they suddenly kind of slow down or stop, yes, I'm going to have to keep clear of them, 
just like if you imagine, you know, I'm driving down the expressway and the boat, the, excuse me, the boat, the car in front of me comes to a sudden stop, I have to make sure that I can stop in time and I can get around them if needs be and not cause an accident. Um, kind of the same idea, right? This boat that's clear ahead, they basically have the right of way. The boat that's clear stern has to keep clear of them, right? If I wanted, if this boat was coming up ahead, I have to figure out, do I go below them? Do I go high of them, for example? And I have to keep clear of them. Now, there's some general limitations to the right of, right of way rules that we just learned, right? Uh, the first one, rule number 14, is avoiding contact. A boat shall avoid contact with another boat if reasonably possible. And so even if you have a situation, let's say you're the right of way boat, the other boat is required to keep clear of you, you should still try to, you shall do, you shall avoid contact if reasonably possible, as best you can. Uh, you know, if they're port and you're starboard and you're coming up and they're just not paying attention and they're going to come right into you, still duck around them. Protest them. You have every right to protest them, but avoid the contact. Uh, please, we don't want to have bumper boats out there. Just avoid the contact as reasonably possible. Number 15, acquiring a right-of-way. When a boat acquires a right-of-way, she shall initially give the other boat room to keep clear. And room can be thought of as space and time. And so if there's a situation, say, I'm a boat and this other boat kind of comes on top of me I, and now we have an overlap and they're windward and I'm lured, I now have right away, but I can't just come right by the top of them. I got to give them a little bit of time and space to be able to keep clear if I've now acquired that right of way. Or it could also be as if I if I've tacked over and now I went from port to starboard and now I'm a starboard tack boat and I have right away over a port tack boat. I have to make sure that they have time and space to be able to keep clear of me. They I can't just tack right on top of them and they have no way of getting around me. Got to get allow give them. You got to allow them at least some time and space so they can keep clear. In some ways, you can think about that. Would it be a fair sailing kind of thing to do is if I tacked another boat and did not give them room to keep clear? No, it probably wouldn't be fair. So we want to make sure that we're doing fair sailing. So in essence, this is kind of that uh, uh, specific wording of how do we deal with that situation there. Changing course. When a right-of-way boat changes course, she also shall give the other boat room to keep clear. And this could be, for example, I'm a leeward uh, boat in a leeward windward situation, and, you know, the wind is starting to shift, and I'm coming up, if you will. Um, I have to give them time, room to keep clear of me. I can't just come right up and slam into them. I probably have to give them some time to kind of slowly get up and so that they can uh, keep clear of me in that situation. Um, some other general limitations, and this actually applies to the overlap rule. If two boats are on the same tack and on their proper course, if a boat clear astern, and so for example, if you imagine here I have this yellow boat, it's clear astern of this blue boat, and then this boat becomes overlapped within two of her hull lengths of to leeward of a boat on the same tack, she shall not sail above her proper course. So if this yellow boat kind of speeds up a little bit, and now it has an overlap. And they're within two, basically, of her hull length, if you imagine, in that circle of this boat, the, the boat that basically gains this right of way. I can't keep going higher than my proper course. I have to sail what is the course. I can't sail high, above her pro my proper course. And so the idea is right, I can't come underneath a boat and basically take them up off the course. At that point, I have to sail to where the mark is. Now, I do have – this boat would have right of way. I mean, this, this windward boat can't come on, down on top of her. It, this leeward boat has to keep clear. But this yellow boat is limited into where, where it can go. It can't just go anywhere it wants to. It doesn't have full right of way. Its right of way is limited in the fact that it can't sail above its proper course. And we kind of do have a definition that if you looked in the definition section is what is proper course. It's a course that a boat would choose in order to sail the course and finish as soon as possible in absence of the other boats, right? And so that's the idea is, is what would be the quickest way basically to finish the course. And this is the, this is, this is the course that this boat must take. And so for example, if the mark is over here, this boat must continue to sail towards the mark. It can't keep, say, going higher and higher to basically push this boat away from the mark. Again, you can kind of think about it. If, if you had a boat that came in from underneath and now had lured and then basically drove this boat off just to drive them off the course, would that be fair sailing? No, it wouldn't be fair sailing. And so, again, this is kind of an actual hard rule based upon, say, that concept of fair sailing. So in terms of a summary of our right away, I think the first four rules are probably the most important. Rule number 10, a port tack boat shall keep clear of a starboard tack boat 
or any starboard tack boat. So that's probably the first rule. If you're on opposite tack, starboard tack has the right of way, port tack must keep clear. Then rule number 11, if they're on the same tack and overlapped, a windward boat must keep clear of the leeward boat. Granted, the leeward boat may be limited to proper course based upon how that overlap was acquired, but in that particular case, you know, a, leeward, a windward boat must keep clear of a leeward boat. If they're in rule 12, if you're on the same tack and not overlap, then a boat that's clear astern must keep, clo keep clear of a boat that's clear ahead. Again, you know, you can't basically run into someone who's in front of you. And rule 13, while tacking, so making, basically making a maneuver when you're kind of flipping the sail from one side to another, the boat must keep clear of the other boats. And so when you're making a large maneuver like that, you have to make sure that you're keeping clear of everyone else. You can't just tack on someone and hope that they keep clear while you're in the middle of your tack. You're going to make sure that when you're making a tap, you have, you take, excuse me, making a tack, that you are able to keep clear while you're making that tack. And until then, you're going back on your course and on your way, you got to keep clear of all the other boats. The next part of racing rule number two, uh, section C, it re deals with marks and obstructions. And so this basically has to deal with room at a mark. Or, so this in some ways limits some of the actions of the right-of-way. So we learned about the basic right-of-ways, but when we start getting into situations where we have a mark or an obstruction, some boats might be entitled to what's called room, space and time basically to maneuver around either a mark or obstruction. And so rule 18, which is mark room, applies between boats when they are required to leave a mark on the same side, and at least one of them is in the zone. And so the zone is defined as the area around a mark within the distance of three hull lengths of the boat nearer to it. A boat is in this zone when any part of her hull is in this zone. And so if you look at these two boats, I have a, a little orange tetrahedron, that's the mark. We have this circle. The, dia the uh, excuse me, the, the radius of this circle, if you will, the, the zone, is three hull lengths of this boat because it's the nearer boat. So if this is a 30-foot boat and this is a 40-foot boat, the zone circle in this particular case is 90 feet because this is three times basically 30 feet. If this was a 40-foot boat and this is a 30-foot boat, then it would be 120 feet, which is three times the 40 feet. Whatever boat is closest to the mark at that particular time, that is considered the zone, right? And so one thing when we're looking at, say, the mark room and the room being able to get around a mark, how this contrasts to keeping clear, right? So keeping clear in the racing rules of sailing defines when a boat keeps clear of a right-of-way boat if the right-of-way boat can sail her course with no need to take avoiding action. And when the boats are overlapped, if the right-of-way boat can also change course in both, direct, in both directions without immediately making contact. And so the idea is is the right-of-way bo uh, right boat, another boat is keeping clear if that right-of-way boat can make its course wherever it needs to go. Uh, and if they're overlapped, for example, if they're close to each other, the right-of-way boat can start changing course right away and that won't make an immediate contact. Granted, the other boat might have to start changing with it. Uh, as the maneuver is starting to happen, but they can't, for example, start immediately turning and create and uh, have an, initial, an immediate contact. There's at least some play in terms of what the boat, the boat that has right away, can do in terms of moving. And so that's keeping clear. Basically, the idea is the right away boat can go where they need to go. They can make their maneuvers, and there's no need for the right away boat to make, uh, say, an immediate action to avoid any sort of collision. Room is defined as the space a boat needs in the existing conditions to comply with any of her obligations under these rules while maneuvering in a prompt and seaman-like way. And so then the idea is is room doesn't give that boat basically license to go where they wherever they want to go. They are allowed basically time and space, if you will, to maneuver around whatever, excuse me, mark or obstruction that is there in a prompt and seaman-like way. So they're gonna make it around the mark and they're going to go along their course, and they're going to get that room to go around the mark, but that's basically all they get. And so mark room specifically is, is specific, defined as room for a boat to leave a mark on the required side. And that's also very important that the sailing instructions say that it's a port rounding, and so the boat has basically got to go on the right side of that mark and leave the mark to her port to the left side. There has to be room so that boat can go and leave that mark to the port side. Um, you can't say, well, you can go around the other way. Mark room is defined that they have to be able to sail the course as described in either the NOR or the sailing instructions. Again, you can kind of think about it in terms of fair sailing in that particular case. 
So 18.2 defines kind of like giving the mark room. So when boats are overlapped, the outside boat shall give the inside boat mark room. And so we can think about this situation here. We have two boats coming up. So we have an inside boat, we have an outside boat. This is a windward boat, this is a leeward boat. And so even though that there's a right away situation here where the outside boat has right of way, the, the outside boat is also must, is required to give room so that this inside boat can come in here and make the rounding around this mark. If a boat is clear ahead when she reaches the zone, the boat clear astern at that moment shall thereafter give her mark room. So that's also kind of important is even if you are, say, in this particular case, actually it's not when we're lower, but it's clear ahead and clear astern. If this boat is clear astern and let's say, well, you know, they kind of make their way in and now they have an overlap. Well, they were already inside that zone. And so since they were already inside that zone for mark room, they must still give that boat room. So you can't come in can't can under, say underneath them, now acquire right away and basically push them off the course or push them into the mark. At that point, you still have to give them room so that they can go around the mark. Granted, the inside boat has to go around the mark in a prompt seaman-like manner, but still they are given room so that they can make it around the mark uh, fairly and safely. A boat is required to also give mark room even if an overlap is broken and a new overlap begins. So if, even if there's some overlap and then it's broken, so let's say maybe this boat at a particular time, um, you know, had an overlap and, oh, you're giving me mark room and now you don't have the overlap. I've cleared the overlap so you don't have, you know, you, you know, I don't have to give you room. That's not true. If once you basically have that requirement for room in that circle, require, regardless of whether or not you gain or lose overlap, you still basically have that obligation to give room. And if she becomes overlapped, the inside boat is still entitled to mark room. So again, like I said, if this boat kind of came up and now has overlapped, this boat is still entitled to mark room in that particular case. There are some exceptions to that mark room. So mark room does not apply between boats on the opposite tacks on a beat to windward. So here we're going to a weather mark. We have a port tack boat and a starboard tack boat. You might think, well, this boat is closer and should be entitled to room. Not in this particular case. So in this particular case, because they're on opposite tacks and they're approaching a mark to windward, so on a beat to windward, this boat is not entitled to room. And so this boat would probably have to duck around the starboard tack boat and make its way around. So one kind of thing is when you're coming close to a mark and you might see this in a race, most boats make their kind of final lay of the line on starboard tack somewhere over here so that when they're coming into the mark, they're coming in on starboard. Uh, you don't want to be coming up close into a mark on port. You're usually going to get into a situation where you might have to duck around other boats. You're really not entitled to room for many of those starboard tech boats. And so the best situation is to kind of make sure you're coming into the mark on starboard in that particular case. <clears throat> uh, you're not entitled to mark room when, between boats on opposite tacks when the proper course is for one, but not both boats to tack. So at least one boat, if the proper course is to tack, then you're not entitled to room. So you can kind of think about it, that particular situation. Again, if one of these boats has to tack, they're not entitled to room because you're not on the correct board to make it around the mark, and so thus you're not entitled to room. Between a boat approaching a mark and one leaving, this is also very important. And so, for example, here, this boat is not entitled to give this inside boat mark room. They are leaving the mark. They are not entitled to room. They need to get clear of the mark. They've already rounded the mark. They're on their way up the course. And they basically, whatever rules might apply, in this case, we have a starboard jive. And so you can see this is the starboard jive. And this is the starboard uh, attack boat in this particular case. Granted, this would probably be a windward leeward type situation. But in this particular case, though, this boat here is not entitled to any sort of room. They need to basically apply whatever normal rules that we might have rules say 10 through 13 that requires you whether you're on port tech versus starboard tech, if you're overlapped, not overlapped. In any of those particular situations, they are not entitled to mark room because they've left the mark. And we also talk about as a mark is also a continuing obstruction. We all also see rules that might relate to an obstruction. So if there's a mark that is also a large obstruction, you can think say like a water intake crib or say like a, a mark that's at the end of the pier, uh, rules related to obstruction might also apply in that particular situation. So we've talked about marks. What is an obstruction? So an obstruction is an object that a boat could not pass without changing course substantially. Um, this is considered though, an object, uh, an object that can be safely passed on only one side, and an object or a line um, can also be designated by the sailing instructions to be uh, obstructions. 
Uh, however, a boat is not an obstruction to another boat unless they are required to keep clear of her. So if I have a situation where there might be another boat that I am required to keep clear of, that might be considered, say, an obstruction to another boat. So that's considered like an obstruction. So if I'm required to keep clear of it and I have a situation where maybe another boat has right away on me, but I also have to keep clear of another right away boat, I might, in that particular case, I'm entitled to room to get around the obstruction. Again, prompt and seaman-like, which means you're making a very uh, quick maneuver or you're not, you know, you're not going off wherever you want to go, but you're able to get around, say, a situation where maybe I have to keep clear of uh, another boat. Uh, you can think of a situation where maybe I have a uh, windward leeward situation and then on top of it there's a boat that's coming in on starboard in that situation if you're the windward boat I need to maybe have room to say I have to duck around this boat so you have to give me room to duck around this boat even though you're leeward so you have to give me room to duck around them um, because they are on starboard tack and I'm on port tack and so that's kind of an obstruction to me and so that leeward boat might have to give me room to duck around say that particular boat However, that's considered not, say, a continuing obstruction. So it's an only an obstruction in that particular instance and not like a permanent obstruction in that case. So room to pass an obstruction. And so this is kind of like with a mark. And so this applies to between two boats when a, at an obstruction, except when the obstruction is a mark that the boats are required to leave on the same side. So obviously that now applies as a rule. And when rule 18 applies between boats and the obstruction is another boat that overlaps with each of them. And so if we look at some of those exceptions in rule 18, for example, that, require, that apply to mark room, if, if that boat that, for example, is another boat that's overlapped between them, and that's the obstruction, but I'm also dealing with a mark room situation, then I need to look in terms of its mark room in that particular case. So giving room and obstruction, a right-of-way boat may choose to pass an obstruction on either side. And so a right-of-way boat has a choice to pass obstruction on either side, and so they are allowed to basically entitled to go which way they want, and they might have to give room or whatever, but they are entitled to choose which side to pass on unless it's specifically delineated out in, say, the sailing instructions in order to race. Uh, when boats are overlapped, the outside boat shall give the inside boat room. And while boats are passing a continuing obstruction, if a boat that was clear astern and required to keep clear becomes overlapped between the other boat and the obstruction, she is not entitled to room. And while the boats remain overlapped, she shall keep clear. And rules 10 and 11 don't apply. And so if you are passing some sort of continuing obstruction, so say a large you know, water intake crib up here, if you will, something that's permanent out there, uh, if a boat is clear astern and now all of a sudden has, say, an overlap, you're, you're not entitled to room. So let's say you kind of snuck on in and now you're entitled to room in that particular case. Um, you, you you can't basically come in and say, and it used to be called barging, I can't barge my way in and say I need room. I'm not entitled to room in that particular case, and so you need to basically still keep clear. And even while, let's say, I have that overlap, I should all, still maintain to keep clear while we're passing that obstruction. Basically, my I, I do not gain rights in that particular case if I'm doing what they used to call barging or kind of pushing my way in, if, if you will. And so in that particular case, in the summary, in terms of mark zone obstructions. If you're within a mark zone, the outside boat must give room to any inside boat. Room does not suspend the right-of-way rules, 10 through 13. Uh, if a boat is required to keep clear, must continue to do so. However, the right-of-way boat might have to give room so that that other boat that might have to keep clear can pass whatever mark or obstruction is there. An obstruction can be a continuing obstruction, for example, a hazard to navigation, or a boat that has a right-of-way. And so if there's a situation, again, like I kind of said, let's say you're on windward, you're, you're on a, you have an overlap situation where you're the windward boat and there's a leeward boat with you and you're coming up upon a boat that is on starboard tack and you guys are both on port tack, that is considered an obstruction. And so the leeward boat might have to give me room to navigate, to maneuver around, say, that starboard tack boat in that particular case. And so that's also considered obstruction, though not a continuing obstruction. So we have a couple examples to kind of go over. In this first case, we have a purple boat versus the yellow boat. And so the kind of the question would be, which boat must keep clear and why? And does the boat need to give room? So in this case, what we have is actually, and some people might think, well, this is the upwind boat, this is the downwind boat. Well, this boat has already kind of passed the center line, and so this boat has the right to kind of keep moving. In reality, this is a situation where we have a starboard boat versus a port boat. 
And so the port tack boat is required to keep clear of a starboard tack boat. So in this particular case, if this yellow boat had to duck around, this yellow boat would be able to protest this boat and this boat would be liable to certain penalties because it, as a port tack boat, it did not keep clear of the starboard tack boat in that case. So usually when you're coming up on <clears throat> particular, say, crossings in this case, if you're the port tack boat, you want to port tack boat. You really want to be mindful of what sort of crossings are coming your way, and do I need to duck other boats? In some cases, maybe tacking is a good situation. So maybe it might have been best for the purple tack purple boat to come here and tack onto starboard, and then come up this way. Uh, those are possibilities, and so you might need to be mindful of what's going on here. I would say one situation though, what's really important is communication with any other boat that's out there. And so in this, in this situation, it might be, if you're getting close to a crossing, is you can hail the other boat to communicate what is their intention. Because maybe this yellow boat is like, well, I'm, a, I'm about to tack anyways. And so they might tack, and then that way you don't need to necessarily tack or keep clear of them. But in this situation, if this was something that the yellow boat now had to maneuver without, me, with, without keeping it to, keep it to avoid a collision here, this yellow boat could protest this purple boat, and this purple boat would be liable to penalties. Now we have a situation here. We have the orange boat versus the green boat. And so in this question is which, which of these two boats must keep clear and why, and which boat needs to give room? Uh, it's a little bit close to see, but if you look here, these boats are on the same tack or on the same you know, board, if you will. Uh, if I drew an imaginary line it's perpendicular to the back of the boat, you probably would see it would, keep, it would not cross any of the boat or equipment here with the green boat. And so in this case, the green boat is clear astern of the orange boat. And so the green boat must keep clear of the orange boat. There's no need for room in this situation. It's just a simple kind of keeping clear. And so this would be basically rule 12, not overlapped on the same tack. The clear stern boat must keep clear of the, clear, of the boat that's clear ahead. Now we have this situation here. So the blue boat versus the red boat. And so here's a question of which boat now must keep clear and why? You might think, well, this is the windward boat, this is the leeward boat. But if you look very closely, the blue boat here is on port tack, right? The red boat here is actually on starboard tack. This is the starboard side of the boat. And this is actually a port, over, port versus starboard situation, or rule 10. And the blue boat is actually required, in this case, to keep clear of the red boat. And so this is actually a good situation that if you're coming up again, if you're coming up on port on a windward mark, you're probably going to have boats that are going to come around it, and they're going to be coming down around, going downwind, and they might be on starboard. This particular boat actually has the right-of-way, and so this boat is actually required to keep clear. Again, probably a good situation of saying that before you start getting close to the weather mark, you probably want to make your way over to the right side of the course and come in up on starboard, because if this boat was coming in on starboard, actually, the, this boat would have the right of way because they would then be the leeward boat in that particular situation, right? And because it would be basically a situation of overlap. So some more examples. We have the red boat versus the blue boat versus the purple boat. So which boats meet, must keep clear and why? And does a boat need to give room? So in this particular situation, we have the blue, like I said, the purple and the red. If we look here, the blue and the purple these are both on port tack. The red is on starboard tack, if you will, or starboard drive, if you will. This is the starboard side of the boat. So in reality, what we have here is between these two boats, we have a port starboard situation, right? Between these two boats, they're overlapped, and there is a windward versus leeward situation. So really, in this situation, the blue boat has no right-of-way. The purple boat has right-of-way on the blue boat, and the red boat has right-of-way on the blue boat. However, in this particular situation, because the blue boat has a situation where they need to keep clear of this red boat. This red boat is considered, in essence, an obstruction in terms of this particular relationship. And because of that, this purple boat must give the blue boat room to go around the red boat. And also, likewise, for example, this red boat needs to give the blue boat room to keep clear of the purple boat. And so this is a situation that both the red boat and the purple boat are actually obliged to give room to the blue boat. They can't squeeze this basically blue boat out, but this blue boat has to kind of keep clear of these two boats. Probably not the best situation to be on. Again, be mindful of where you are on the course. You probably don't want to try to get yourself in this kind of situation, but these situations can come up, and so be mindful of what's going on there. So now we have a situation of the yellow boat versus the green boat. 
right? And so which boat must keep clear and why? And does a boat need to give the other boat room? So if we look at these, these two boats are on the same tack or jibe, if you will, they're going downwind. The wind's coming over the same side of the boat. There is an overlap. You can draw that imaginary line. It's intersecting here. And so this is windward. This is leeward, right? This is the boat that's basically kind of closer to the wind or on the wind, the weather side of this boat. And this boat is on the leeward side, if you will. And so in this particular situation, this boat has right of way. This boat is required to keep clear, but they're approaching this orange tetrahedron, which is a mark of the course. It looks like they need to keep clear of it. And so this yellow boat needs to give the green boat room to be able to make it around that mark. Um, they need to make it around the mark in a nice manner. They can't just kind of like, oh, I'm going to keep sailing this way or I'm going to keep sailing over on that way. They need to make it around the mark. And this yellow boat is obliged to give them room so they can make it around the mark. Now we have this situation here where we have a purple boat and a blue boat. It's kind of like a Wednesday night because here we have, we have one of the water intake cribs and we have all these nice little orange circles here, right? And so in this particular situation, what boat must keep clear and why? And does a boat need to give room? So here, again, we have two boats. There's an overlap, so it's windward and leeward. The leeward boat has the right of way. The windward boat is required to keep clear. But they're coming up on this obstruction. Now, you could say that, well, this boat, blue boat, has basically entitled to do whatever they want. But in this case, we have the crib. I mean, there's space here, but these are the government guard marks. And from that standpoint, a boat, according to government regulations, cannot sail with inside these guard marks. And so this whole space, even though this boat could navigate in there, this boat is entitled to get room to go all the way around this way. Why? Because they cannot go inside this space. Even though they could physically go inside the space, government regula regulations basically prohibit them from entering this space inside the guard marks. And so this blue boat must give the purple boat room to navigate around these marks in this particular case, right? There is a note that I would say it's in this context, it's not clear if this is an obstruction. So maybe these two boats are sailing off and there's a, there's a mark up here and the crib is just an obstruction of the course, or the crib could be part of the course in which which side the boats are required to go around the crib might be defined, in which case that would be mark room. But in either case, there's gonna be probably some amount, <laughs> excuse me, some obligation of room in this case where this purple boat is entitled to room to go around. So that was kind of the basic rules. Um, hopefully in most situations, everybody's uh, um, the, uh, adhering to the basic right of way rule, right of way rules and room. Um, if we don't get that situation and something does happen, uh, protests and penalties will, can come into play. And so these are in part five. There's a number of rules that you can look at in terms of that. Uh, the information is here in terms of the rules that apply to protests and penalties, but we'll kind of go over the most important ones, if you will. <clears throat> so a protest, as defined by the Racing Rules of Sailing, is an allegation made under Rule 61.2, and you can look at that rule, but it's basically made, it's an allegation made by any boat, a race committee, a technical committee, or a protest committee that a boat has broken another rule. So sailing is basically kind of a self refereed sport. And so if you have a situation where you have, you're a boat that has a right of way and another boat uh, does not keep clear of you, you can protest that boat and claim basically make an allegation that they did not follow the rules, they broke one of the rules. Um, when you make a protest, what's really important is 61.2 says informing the protestee. The protesting boat, whoever that whatever that entity is, be it a boat, a race committee, et cetera, shall inform the other boat at the first reasonable opportunity by doing so, she shall hail protest and conspicuously display a red flag. She shall display the red flag until she is no longer racing. And that's actually very important. So at the first reasonable opportunity, granted, you know, if you're in the middle of something and you've done a maneuver to try to keep clear of them, as soon as you can, as it's reasonable, you have to make the protest. You shall hail, just yell out the word protest, um, and conspicuously display a red flag. And so this red flag is, is fine out. I've seen a, a number of racers, what they often have is they have like a little piece of PVC tube that's tied onto the backstay and stuffed inside that backstay is a red flag that's on a little string. And so when they want to protest, they basically yank on the string and now the flag is flying. And so this red flag is now flying and they can indicate that they have protested another boat. Um, what's really important is even if that boat, and we'll talk about penalties, even if that boat takes a penalty turn, the boat that's 
making the protest, she'll continue to display that red flag until she's no longer racing. This is actually really important as kind of race committee because when we're watching boats that are finishing, if we notice a boat that has a red flag flying, we'll often, you know, maybe call onto the radio or hail them and ask them, are you filing a, a formal protest? You know, is there something we basically need to know about? Uh, we can go into some of those details later, but that it basically informs everyone that a protest was basically made. If a protest is made, and I would say there's a number of penalties, probably the best penalty is a penalty at the time of the incident, so taking a penalty. If you're in a situation where you uh, break one of the rules, uh, for example, you fail to keep clear, the best bet to do, or the best thing you'll probably do, is take your penalty turns. It's one of those things is by taking a penalty turn, it's always possible potentially to make up that time that you lost on the race course. However, if you wait for the protest room, you might be assigned a scoring penalty or they might even disqualify you from the race. So the best thing to do is take your penalty turn. And in that case, unless there's, for example, a egregious, uh, you know, if there's some sort of uh, damage or if there's some other sort of thing that makes it a, an egregious um, violation of the rule, then there might be some other penalties. But in most cases, you don't have that. And if there's a situation that you go into a protest committee or a protest committee hearing, and there is a boat that said, I, you know, this other boat makes an allegation that I was on starboard. You did not keep clear of me when I was on, when you were on port and I protest you. And then if in that thing you said, well, you know, and I took my two penalty turns, at that point, the race committee might give the other boat based upon their situation. If it caused them, you know, damage or something like that and they couldn't race, they might give them redress. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But likely the, the protest committee will not give you any other penalties. They say, well, he took the penalty turns. There's nothing more we need to do in this situation. Like I said, unless it's an egregious uh, violation of the rule, but the best thing to do is take your penalty turn. So a boat may take two turns, a two turns penalty. We often heard of this as a 720. We'll talk about that in a bit. When she has broken one of the more rules in part two. So again, this is right away room in, in, that, case, in that case, in an, in an incident while racing. So while you're on the race, and if you violate one of the part two rules, you need to take a two turns penalty. You can take a two turns penalty to basically, that's your penalty for that rule. There's also a one turn penalty or sometimes called the 360 when she has broken rule 31, which basically means if you've touched a mark. Uh, that's gonna be important too. So if you touch a mark, the penalty is to take a turn. The penalty is not to go around the mark again. I've seen a lot of people do this. That's not the, that is not the penalty to do. The penalty to do is take a turn. And we'll talk about that in a second. So in terms of the penalty turns, these are detailed in, if you're interested, racing rule of sailing number 44.2. What's really important when you read this, the first sentence says, after getting well clear of all other, of other boats as soon after the incident as possible. So what's really important in there, you need to get well clear of the other boats and as soon as, after the incident as possible, right? As soon as possible, you wanna take these turns. That's what you're supposed to be doing but you need to get clear of everyone. Just don't take the turns in the middle of it and hope that everybody keeps clear of you. Get it kind of out of the way, make sure you're not in anyone's way and make your penalty turns. A boat takes a one or two turn penalty by promptly making the required number of turns in the same direction. Each turn is one tack and one jive. So we're showing a circle here. This is kind of why they call it either 360 or 720. So one tack, one jive. If you made one tack and one jive at that point, you've con you've completed one turn. If it's a 720 or a two turn penalty, you make another tack and a another jive, and at that point you've now completed it. It could also be jive tack, so a jive followed by a tack is one turn, and a jive followed by a tack is another turn. But it's always in the same direction. You can't like turn this way and then decide to turn the other way. You always gotta turn in either if you go, for example, if you wanna turn to the right, you can turn to the left, but both of them have to be in the same direction, and it's a tack and a jive promptly, not like I'm gonna tack, I'm gonna go up for a bit, and then I'm gonna jive, and then I'm gonna go down for a while, and I'm gonna tack, and then maybe I'll come over here, then I'll jive again, for example. Uh, it has to be basically a tack, jive, tack, jive, or jive, tack, jive, tack, whatever the order is. So here's an example of a, a 720 incident, if you will. So we have these three boats, we have the purple boat, the yellow boat, and the green boat. As you can see here, probably what we're gonna have a situation here is the yellow boat was on starboard tack, the purple boat failed to keep clear. And so in this particular case, the yellow boat now file, file, basically makes a protest, they display the red flag, they hail the word protest, 
and they've now protested the purple boat. What's the purple boat going to do? It's actually going to duck around this green boat, so it keeps clear, ducks around the green boat, basically is now getting away from these other boats, so it's kind of getting well clear of these other boats. And at this point, it's now saying it's starting its jive to do its penalty turn. So it'll probably do a jive, attack, another jive, and another attack. And at that point, once they've made this last tack, they can either continue this way. They could always go up a little bit and tack again if they wanted to go back this way on starboard. It doesn't matter at that point as long as you've made a jive and attack, a jive and attack, or potentially attack and a jive and attack and a jive. They could have gone and made the turn this way, or they can make the turn this way. It really doesn't matter which way the turn is as long as it's a series of attacks and jives sequentially. Basically, if you do a 720, you have to do two jives and two tacks sequentially. So, you know, either a jive, tack, jive, tack, or tack, jive, tack, jive. And it has to be done promptly. And you're, again, keeping clear of everyone. This yellow boat here will continue to fly this red flag until they finish, right? As long as they're racing, they'll continue to fly this red flag, indicating that they protested this purple boat. A one turn example. And so, we have this purple boat and this yellow boat, they're coming to the fin, they're coming around this mark. This yellow boat basically rubs up against the, the mark of the course, so this is the leeward mark, and so this yellow boat touched that leeward mark. In that particular case, we can see that the yellow boat sails clear of the leeward mark and other boats. And so this, in this particular case, and this is probably the best thing you do, is this yellow boat basically just kind of reached off a little bit to kind of get out of the way of this leeward mark. At this point, it's now decided to make its penalty turn. It started with, in this particular case, it's probably jiving, it'll do attack. Once it's done its jive and its attack, it then can either continue off this way, or it could say, for example, tack over and go back uh, on starboard if it wants. But it has to make at least one jive and tack, or one tack and jive, whichever the order is. What's really important, the yellow boat does not round the mark again. Uh, you're not going around the mark again, and that's actually really important. Other boats are probably coming around the mark. Don't congest up that mark. Get out of the way of the mark, make your 360, go along your way. That's what's really important in that particular case, okay? So that's what you need to do. Don't round the mark again, go make your 360. Now the boat made the 360 here, it could, could have made it here. Uh, I would say in some cases, this example, we showed the yellow boat kind of going further downwind of this leeward mark and making the 720, or the 360, excuse me. It's probably a good place to do it. Why? Most boats, when they're coming around here and you make this little reach, you're kind of off away, or you could have been doing it over here. You're away from where most boats are going to be coming around. And so that uh, requirement to keeping well clear of everyone while you're making your 360 is easy to satisfy if you just basically kind of get away from the course just a little bit. So you're just away from this mark. If you're further down with the lure mark, very few boats are going to be coming down and bothering you while you're doing your 360. Likewise, if you reached off and kind of went in this direction, again, probably not too many boats are coming up here. You could have gone this way, but you do run the risk of that some boats might be coming down this way and deciding, hey, I want to go over this way or I'm going to go over this way, for example, wherever they might be going. So when you, if you take, say, a 360, you know, that's kind of on the course, closer down into the course section from that mark, you know, you run the risk of you might have a boat that's making a rounding and now you're doing a 360 and you're in front of them and you're required to keep clear. Usually when you're in the middle of, say, a penalty turn, you're really focusing on your penalty turn, doing your tax and doing your jive, and you may not be fully paying attention to all the boats that are around you. And so it's really important to probably give yourself some space so that you're well clear of everyone. Um, it's also possible to file a formal written protest. Um, 61.2 has uh, some details on filing a written protest. A protest shall be in writing and identify what's important. They have some important things that are defined in the racing rules of sailing. The protester and the protestee, what is the nature of the incident, when and where the incident occurred, any rule that the protester thinks, believes that was broken, uh, the name of the protester's representative, if there is one such thing. There's a lot of information that's kind of required. What's really helpful is there's a number of protest forms that are usually available. Uh, the organizing authority for your particular race might provide a protest form or give you a link. If not, their U.S. sailing has kind of a standard form. This is available online and in the Racing Rules app. Uh, one of the things with the newer Racing Rules, um, it used to be the Racing Rules would kind of just come as a PDF. You could download a PDF from U.S. sailing. They now created the app. Uh, the app is actually really nice. It does have uh, a form section in it where you can actually fill out this form, say, on your phone or on your tablet. You can actually do make little diagrams of what was the incident, 
uh, showing the little boats where you were going, and then you could basically file it electronically or create a PDF then that would be then attached to or printed out that you could then, you know, uh, file with whatever uh, organizing authority, the race committee, in terms of a formal protest. Uh, one thing that's really important is be aware of the time limit for filing a written protest. If you file a written protest, there is a time limit on when you can do that. Um, this may be defined in the notice of race or the sailing instruction. So be careful, look at see what that says. If there is no limit stating in the sailing instruction, then the limit is two hours after the last boat in the race finishes. This is in the racing rules of sailing. So if there is no limit, the default limit is two hours after the last boat in the race finishes. And so the idea is, is to make that protest and get it in. Uh, they don't, race committees don't want to have it where, you know, you know, five hours later, you finally fill in your paperwork for a protest. You know, if, if, if you're going to file a written protest, get that written protest in there. Granted, maybe there's a situation where you are out on the course and it might take a while to get into dock and to kind of get things filed for protest. Uh, one thing that's important when you finish and the race committee may contact you if they see you're flying the red flag. If they don't, it's very good to hail them. That can give them an, a heads up that you're going to be filing a written protest. They may tell you, be mindful of the deadline or they might give you some information on that, but at least give them the head ups, heads up so that they know that they're looking for it. Um, related to that is racing rule number 62, redress. So redress is considered any adjustment of score or standing based on a claim of, say, improper action or mission by the race committee, protest committee, organizing authority, technical committee for the event, injury or physical damage because of an action of a boat that was breaking a rule in part two, or took an appropriate and took appropriate penalty or was penalized. And so if there was some, say, injury or physical damage relating to uh, a, a violation of part two, say uh, you had a boat that was poor tech and they came and they damaged you and you couldn't finish off the race, you can file for redress to say, I need an adjustment of my score standing. Giving help, this is actually really important, giving help except to herself or her crew, so in compliance with racing rule 1.1. So for example, if there was another boat that's in distress that was out there, um, and you gave them aid. One thing you can do in many of these races is what you can do is record the time that you basically stopped racing, where you made the decision and you started to go off to give that boat aid. You gave that boat aid, made sure everything was, everyone was okay, and then record the time that you started racing again. And most, pro most uh, race committees that if you have those two times and you file a redress, so you kind of basically would file a redress form through the protest form and say, I gave aid, here's when I left, here's when I stopped racing, here's when I started racing. In many cases, you'll get that time deducted from your total time because the idea is, is you were providing aid and at that time, it's not counting towards you being on the race. You know, we want to make sure that everyone's safe out there. So if you do provide help or aid or assistance, you can file for redress to adjust your score based upon the fact that you were not racing at the time, but actually providing aid to another vessel. And if there was any action of another boat that resulted in a penalty under the rule, so, you know, if there was some other action that, that resulted in some sort of penalty under the rule and then uh, it had an adverse effect on your ability to sail the course, you can file for redress to get an adjustment. Granted, it will be the protest committee that will, will take that under advisement, but those are the things that you can do. So in terms of the protest and penalty summary, if you're making a protest, uh, do so at the first reasonable opportunity. Uh, hail protest and conspicuously display your red flag. That is the best thing you can do in that particular case. So make that, you know, hail protest, display your red flag if you're making a protest. Uh, and continue to display that flag for the remainder of that race. Um, if you violated, violated a rule, best course of action is to just own up to that penalty, own up to that violation, and take your penalty. Uh, after you get well clear of other boats, as soon as after the incident possible, that's really important. If you violated some sort of right of way or room, make a 720 or two turns penalty. If you've touched a mark, go and complete one turn. Again, getting well clear of other boats and as soon after the incident as possible. If needs be, you can file a written protest. You can redress, request redress if you sustained injury or damage due to an incident. And you can also request redress if you provide aid or give help to another boat or members of its crew. So if there's another boat out there that is in distress and you provide aid or assistance, you can definitely file for redress. Uh, I would say is keep track of when you, you know, when you stop racing and when you start racing.
that's usually one kind of the question in terms of what kind of redress is going to be given. It's usually less of a question of if a boat gives aid, will there be given redress? That's usually a pretty safe assumption. They're going to give you redress. The question always is, is how much of a redress or adjustment will be given, given. And so if you can have that information with you in terms of this is when I stopped racing, this is the time when I started racing again. That gives the, the protest committee the exact piece of information they need to decide on how much redress should be given. And that's usually what they need more than anything. Um, and I would say that. So kind of the summary of the overall course, we talked about the race documents, the NOR, the SIs. These will provide the details for an event or race, the dates, the courses, the requirements, the rules, you know, the fees, those sorts of information. Uh, be aware of the course layout and the marks. These are going to be in your NORs and your SIs, so you don't know, read them through. The SIs is usually going to be the document that's going to have all the information you're going to need on race day. So it's very usually a great idea to have that printed out. Have that on board, because if you have a question, it's always something you can pull that up you know, between races, have it posted, certain things, you know, if there's a complicated course, you could take a piece of that, you know, SI and cut it out and like, you know, tape it on somewhere in your combing, say in your cockpit, and you can like stare at it to see like, you know, what, what are say my next mark or what's this going to be or what's going to be the starting sequence. In that mind, you know, be mindful of the starting signals and sequence. Know what your flags are going to be like. When is you're going to be, when are you going to start? What's the section before you? When are they going to start, you know? And that gives you an idea of knowing when is it your turn to get up to the starting line? When is it your turn to start? Um, what should you do when you say meet another boat, right? You know, if you're on port tech, you must keep clear of a starboard tech boat. If you're a windward boat and you are overlapped with a leeward boat and you're both on the same tech, you need to keep clear of a leeward boat. Be aware that though there are limitations of these right away, and boats are entitled to room at a mark or an obstruction. And if your boat, if a boat does not keep clear or give room, that's where protests and penalties come into play. So thank you all for attending the course. Um, if you have, please fill out the feedback form URL, and uh, we'll be around for any questions if needs be.